Hello, I'm Bob Cowley, Chair of the Oxford Tremano Group. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Uh, really looking forward to today's talk. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Joanna Banieska, to introduce tonight's speaker. She Hello, everyone, and good evening. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Trajce, who is speaking to us from Albania. And Alex might be from Albania, but he's a little bit of a local because we've met when he was at Oxford in 2008, when he was doing his postgrad certificate in wildlife conservation at the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit. He then went on to do his MSc here and then moved to Roehampton to do his doctorate. And subsequently, he's been working in the prote protection and preservation of natural environment in Albania, which is an NGO, um, actually the first environmental NGO in Albania, where he's the executive director. Um, and the organization focuses on wildlife management and conservation, not only in Albania, but also in the general region. And today, Alex will speak to us about the Balkan links. links. So I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing that talk. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Alison. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you, and uh, I very much value the invitation and the chance to uh, present uh, my work, which is actually not just my work, but is the work of many people with whom I collaborate with on the uh, protection of a very critically uh, endangered uh, species, which is the Balkan lynx. So I will start by sharing my screen and I'll start the presentation. If, if you can see it, if you can just give me a, a thumbs up. Okay, it's good. Um, okay, so Mm -hmm. To give you a little bit of background about uh, myself, uh, I have started uh, to work on Balkan lynx and its uh, conservation for quite a long time, uh, or at least it, it seems to me like it's a long time. Uh, basically, I started working uh, uh, as a volunteer at the organization that uh, Joanna mentioned, Protection and Preservation of Natural Environment in, in Albania. Uh, since I was 20 years old, when I was doing my uh, undergrad studies in, in Albania, and I volunteered with them for uh, two years before actually starting to work full time with the organization. And uh, uh, around 2006, uh, which is yeah 15 years ago now, uh, I started working on the Balkan Lynx uh, recovery program, which uh, is an initiative that uh, started that year. Uh, and is continuing actually uh, to date to be implemented. So it's one of the longest uh, running projects that our organization has, and actually one of the longest uh, conservation initiatives in the uh, entire Balkans Peninsula. Uh, so this is what uh, we will be talking about. Uh, this is the Balkan lynx. Uh, the, the Balkan lynx is actually a, a subspecies of the um, widely and commonly known Eurasian lynx, which are spread from uh, basically Central Europe uh, all the way to, to Siberia and uh, to, to Eastern Siberia, basically. Um, in, in Europe, uh, this is the distribution of uh, Eurasian lynx. And uh, as you can see, it's, it's quite a fragmented distribution. Uh, the Eurasian lynx used to be much more widespread in the, in the continent and they had uh, uh, they were basically roaming throughout the entire continent even in the in the in the british islands they were present up to the 10th century ad uh, and uh, they they got extinct after, you know, in in most of uh, uh, western europe throughout medieval times and up up to the uh, uh, and industrial revolution in the in the 19th century. Starting from the second half of the 20th century, there were uh, considerable efforts were done to bring back the species in, in, uh, in uh, uh, several parts of Central and Western Europe. And most of the populations that you see now, which, which are in Switzerland, in, in Czech Republic, in France, uh, 
in Croatia, Slovenia, and Bosnia, they originate from reintroduced uh, individuals in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the uh, population that we are actually talking about is this one, this tiny population in the southernmost uh, edge of the continent. Uh, and that's actually the most endangered indigenous population. So, so it has been there for uh, millennia, so it never went extinct even though it is now persisting at, uh, at very low numbers. So besides the Balkan lynx population, uh, you have in Central Europe the, the Carpathian uh, population, which is in, in much better uh, status, we would say. It has a much uh, better conservation status. And in the north, we have the Scandinavian population and the Baltic, and the Baltic countries population which also is doing uh, a little bit better than the, uh, the, the Balkan links. So from uh, all the information that uh, we have so far and from the uh, latest assessment that uh, we have done, uh, this is the um, currently known distribution of, of the Balkan links. So uh, the uh, yellow, yellowish areas are areas of known presence and reproduction. Uh, the areas which are in, in, in brown color, uh, as you can see, they are areas of uh, occasional presence and of potential recolonization, but not areas of, of permanent uh, presence. In 2015, we did a red list uh, assessment of the population. And uh, uh, what we estimated was that uh, less than uh, 50 individuals survived. And uh, most of them, as you can see also from the map, are in the border areas between uh, Albania, Macedonia, Kosovo, and, uh, and uh, Montenegro. Uh, out of all this, we estimate that uh, in Albania, less than 10 to 15 individuals are surviving. So we are basically talking on, on about very, very low numbers. So we are talking about population which uh, is on the brink of, uh, of extinction and it's uh, severely threatened. Uh, so why, why do we care so much about the Balkan links? Uh, it's not just uh, because we, we like it as a species, of course we do, uh, <laughs> but uh, also because we, uh, we like to believe that it, it is somehow special. And actually genetic studies have shown that it's a, it's a special population. And from the preliminary, uh, let's say, uh, preliminary studies that have been done on, on their genetic differentiation, we can see that it differs uh, genetically from other uh, Eurasian, link popu Eurasian links population throughout the world. And it uh, most likely fulfills criteria to be uh, considered a separate subspecies of, uh, of the Eurasian links. Actually, the, this has been identified even before so even, uh, even before we had the genetic tools to dis distinguish uh, populations, uh, a couple of scientists uh, from, from the Balkans already identified the Balkan links as being uh, uh, separate from other links in, in the European continent, mainly based on morphometric uh, measurements of, uh, of uh, uh, their bones and mainly of their skull. So considering the, uh, the critical situation of the population, which uh, had been known for, for quite a long time, uh, but uh, unfortunately due, due to the political and, uh, and the social conditions present in the Balkans, uh, as most of you probably already know, the 90s weren't uh, an easy time to, to live in the Balkans. There were several wars going on in the region, many new countries uh, uh, being born and uh, a lot of political tension in the region. So nature conservation in general and uh, species conservation in particular was one of the last things on, on, on people's minds. So uh, once the, the situation calmed down in the early to mid 2000s, we, we had much better uh, conditions to, to focus on on these pressing issues uh, such as nature conservation. And uh, actually in, in November, 2005, uh, the Balkan Links Recovery Program was launched by uh, uh, a cooperation, a consortium of uh, Albanian, uh, Macedonian, uh, German and Swiss organization, also with the support of some 
uh, Norwegian uh, organizations. So uh, basically, the reason why we we wanted to focus on links, as I also said earlier, uh, was not just because we 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 liked it as an animal, even though it's 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 a fascinating uh, species. It's uh, really beautiful to see it, and it's really inspiring and uh, it, it brings joy to everyone who works on, on, on that species, but also because by being a top predator, uh, as most of you very well know, it stands on the top of, of the food chain. And if you are working on the conservation of, uh, of a predator, of a top predator, uh, you cannot just focus on, on the species. I mean, you can, you can do a lot of things, but you need to focus on a, on a wide, uh, uh, on a vast spectrum of things to ensure its uh, its survival. So to save the lynx, you actually need to to have uh, to save uh, its prey. So the the lynx needs to have enough food base to survive, and of course to have a good uh, prey base, you need to ensure uh, healthy uh, habitats and ecosystems. And it's actually in these ecosystems where uh, also people live. So you need to consider the human aspect of uh, of uh, uh, preserving the species and the the potential conflicts that might arise by uh, the presence of the species or by the conservation measures that uh, uh, we need to undertake uh, to to preserve this uh, uh, this species so it's it's uh, it's when we talk about lynx conservation, sometimes I, I think that it has very little to do about lynx rather than much more to do about everything that is uh, leading up to the lynx. <clears throat> so be, besides all that, uh, as I told you earlier, this uh, subspecies is present in a region of, uh, of uh, a turbulent past. Uh, and uh, it's if you look at the map of Europe, um, if, if you if you look at the southeastern part, you will probably not even read the names of the countries because there is not space in the map to write the name. You have so many countries that are so small that they usually just put numbers and you find the names at the footnote of of, of the map. So uh, the links actually survives in this very fragmented political landscape. So they are present in in uh, in the southwest uh, Balkans, which is an area that is uh, uh, presently shared by Albania and uh, by three former uh, Yugoslavian countries: Montenegro, Kosovo, and Macedonia. North Macedonia, as it it is known now. Uh, we have some sporadic uh, evidence from uh, Greece, from northern Greece. However, there is no uh, uh, conclusive argument. Uh, a conclusive evidence on the permanent presence of uh, Balkan lynx in, in Greece. So far, they can, they can uh, we hope that they will make it in the future to, to establish uh, uh, their presence there. So when we started working about uh, lynx, what we knew was that we didn't know much actually. So uh, uh, the first thing that we did was to go out uh, in areas where we thought uh, links uh, were present and to talk to the people that were actually close to to nature and to people who uh, who we thought might have the higher chances to have encountered links and to know uh, their ecology and uh, the species and the way how they lived so these were uh, obviously locals that uh, spent a lot of time in nature like uh, shepherds uh, hunters uh, farmers sometimes even uh, uh, village bar owners or pub owners. Uh, you know, pubs are a, a central location where everyone gathers and shares information. So, uh, so we, we did this, uh, this questionnaire surveys throughout uh, most of the mountainous areas of uh, Albania, North Macedonia, and later on, even in Kosovo and in Montenegro. And that's where we actually started to get the first glimpses of how the situation is and uh, 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 how much the people knew the species and uh, where, where they thought it, uh, it was present. And it was around this time that we started uh, encountering the first hard evidences, so the first uh, uh, hard facts of Link's uh, presence in, in, in uh, these countries. 
but unfortunately it wasn't in the form of uh, uh, the glorious uh, animal standing on top of a cliff, uh, but in form of actually hunted trophies uh, uh, where we, we would find the, uh, the animal being uh, um, embalmed, stuffed and kept as, as trophy animals in various uh, places like restaurants or, or bars and shown as, uh, as trophy by uh, several hunters. Even though this was, of course, uh, uh, sad, uh, sad evidences for us, uh, in a way, and, and, and when it comes to the studying the distribution and uh, ecology of, uh, of the species, it's at the end of the day, it was evidence. So uh, we started mapping out these evidences and uh, it opened uh, up the way for, for us to uh, start focusing on other methods to, to study the species in in nature and we started setting camera traps in uh, various mountainous areas where we had the highest uh, uh, evidences from either from dead individuals or or by confirmations that we got from uh, the questioners that we did with uh, with locals and uh, the lynx is, is is a very interesting species in that regard in that it's it's very lazy in the way how they move. So if if they are present in an area, they will stick to uh, main trails, uh, to forest roads. They don't like to spend a lot of energy by walking up and down cliffs or to go in very uh, remote areas, as as one would think. Uh, but they they usually stick to to certain trails and they uh, keep their home ranges more or less unchanged throughout their life. So basically, if you are, if uh, if one is using camera trapping and there is a lynx present in a particular region, chances are high that uh, you will eventually eventually capture them uh, via via photo traps. And as a matter of fact, we did. And uh, in March 2011, we got the uh, the first lynx picture in Albania. Our colleagues in North Macedonia had gotten. Uh, a lynx evidence even earlier than that. They already got their first uh, lynx evidence in uh, December 2007. Uh, we were a bit late uh, uh, with this evidence and actually we were even thinking that the, the uh, subspecies might have even gone extinct in, uh, in Albania. Uh, we were about to declare it extinct uh, and um, Happily enough, we didn't. We got this first evidence of uh, of lynx in the mountains of uh, north central Albania. And uh, as I said earlier, lynx are very lazy species. So uh, once you you find one, you are bound to find all all the other ones in the in the vicinity. So after the first picture, we started getting more and more pictures by different individuals. And uh, uh, basically proved the existence of a small subpopulation in, uh, in central north uh, uh, Albania. And uh, when, when I say uh, we, we started to find different individuals, uh, we, we are quite convinced about that because lynx, like uh, many other striped or spotted species, they have a unique coat pattern which means that uh, if you get the photograph of a lynx and you compare it with another photograph of a lynx from the combination of the dots of the, of the spots in their coat, you can actually tell one individual from another. If people here are familiar, for example, with uh, tiger research or with zebra research or with leopard research, it's, it's basically the same. And they use, uh, they use the camera trapping methodology to actually estimate the number of uh, individuals being present in, in one area because it's so easy to actually identify one individual from the other. And uh, yeah, sometimes we were, oh, okay, sorry. Sometimes we were luckier um, when, it came to, uh, when it came to our camera trapping effort. I have here a video, but as it's usually the case, uh, videos on uh, on presentations tend not to work as this one is doing. Um, ah, okay. So we were we, we were sometimes very very lucky uh, in in our um, camera trapping setting uh, as sometimes we uh, we would get a link standing in front of a camera for quite a prolonged period of time. Uh, 
basically this is just to show that we got really good in <laughs> in surveying links and we got really good in in finding the the spots where they say up to the point where they actually started posing for us so i'm sharing now this video that we have i hope you can also hear the sound They, they started to get really comfortable in front of our cameras. And it's bath time. Okay. Um, yeah, I hope I hope you enjoyed that uh, that video. It's it's actually uh, pure luck, and it's actually from people who do camera trapping and they know how randomly animals move. It's actually quite uh, uh, lucky to get an individual standing in front of the camera for such a long time and uh, and posing. And we didn't use any lure, lure or or anything. I mean, you can use lure to to keep the animals in front of of the camera, but in this particular case, we weren't using any lure or, or, or anything. So the, the next question that most people ask is, OK, now you know where links are. You know uh, what they need. What do you do? Uh, how, what do you actually do to, to protect them? Uh, and actually, it's not an easy answer. <laughs> there are many things that uh, you can do, many things that you can do wrong. and. Uh, uh, many things that uh, you want to do, but you cannot do because you don't have the money. Uh, so one of the uh, approaches that uh, we take when it comes to uh, species conservation and particularly about lynx conservation is to work on the protection of uh, the areas where they live. So to, to protect the remaining habitats where they uh, uh, live, roam and uh, reproduce. Uh, and uh, we we have been moderately, or I would say moderately successful in getting uh, new areas uh, protected in uh, Albania and North Macedonia, areas where we uh, either know that uh, the lynx is present by field evidence that we have, uh, or areas that we think are very suitable for their future recovery. So we sort of prepare the conditions for uh, for the species uh, return. And it's quite important to stress here, also from what I said earlier, by being such a fragmented political uh, landscape, you have so many countries in such a small space, it's, it's of paramount importance that uh, countries actually collaborate together to, to protect the species. It's impossible to uh, for one country single-handedly to say that they are going to, to protect the lynx uh, simply because there is not enough space. The lynx is, is an animal that uh, uh, one, one individual might requ require up to, uh, on average, up to 400 to 500 square kilometers as a home range. And there are cases where, where they can even occupy 1,000 uh, and even more sometimes square kilometers of home range. So it's impossible for uh, countries that are uh, 15,000 to 30,000 square kilometers uh, to, to say that they're going to protect the uh, entire lynx population simply because there is not enough natural space in, uh, in, in uh, one single country. So it's, uh, and, and of course, we know that uh, unlike uh, people who need passports to move from one country to the other, the lynx do not require passport and they can easily cross the border from one country to the other. And if they are protected on one side, but hunted on the other side, all the conservation efforts that one country has done go basically in vain uh, as, as the, the animal might get shot on the other side of, of uh, the border. Okay. Um, 
I, I want to also <laughs> maybe uh, flaunt also the other large carnivores that uh, we have uh, in, in Albania and in the Southwest Balkans in general. I know that in UK, you are not very fond of uh, large carnivores or you have gotten rid of them uh, uh, many centuries ago. Hopefully now there is a stronger debate uh, and, uh, and uh, a movement for bringing them back. Uh, but uh, uh, as, a, as a country where we have uh, all three large carnivores present, um, well, four, if you consider the jackal as a large carnivore as well, as, as uh, many people do, uh, it's, uh, it's actually an issue of, uh, of uh, acceptance of, of people and uh, uh, having these people accepting to have these animals in the landscape. The situation with grey wolves, for example, in Albania, it's much better than, uh, than that of lynx. We have uh, an estimated population of uh, 200 to 250 uh, individuals. They are, of course, shared with neighboring countries. Um, there is no clear uh, distinction of, of that population with, uh, with the one that we share with the bordering countries. Uh, we have the brown bears as well. The population is uh, also doing a bit better, so they, they are stable. We have uh, 180 to 200 individuals present in, uh, in Albania. And uh, that is, of course, another species of conservation concern. And uh, it's something that uh, me and my organization focuses on for uh, protecting over the long term. But what it's important to say, and I was, as I was saying earlier, uh, these species do not live somewhere in the remote. Uh, I mean, many of you might have seen documentaries from uh, Yellowstone or from African parks or I don't know, somewhere else where you have this clear distinction of where nature ends and people begin or this clear division of what constitutes nature and what, is, what belongs to the people. Here, it's not like that. Here, uh, the, the, the border between where people and the animal live, it's very blurred. It, it uh, overlaps with the one another. And it's very much a situation where uh, these species have to survive in a landscape that is full. Well, if not full, where people are present, where people live, where people use natural resources, and where people come into contact with large carnivores almost on a daily basis. So these are traditional uh, communities mostly. They conduct small scale, uh, mostly subsistence farming. So there is not that much intensive agriculture going on. They do livestock breeding. They engage with forestry, beekeeping, plant collection. So as you can see, there are all activities that basically require people to spend considerable times uh, time uh, of their day in nature, so the potential for interaction between them and large carnivores and lynx in particular is quite high. Now, when we are talking about uh, a situation like this, it's uh, it's important to say that uh, uh, knowledge on on the relationships that are created in one place uh, between lynx and humans are quite crucial if we're going to implement conservation measures. So we need to really know what people think of the species. We need to know uh, how people, people's lives intersect with the lynx lives before we actually start implementing any uh, conservation measure. And it's really important to work with, uh, with local community and to actually actively engage them in lynx conservation if we want to have uh, effective conservation measures in, in, uh, uh, in place. Uh, unfortunately, it, we are tiny countries, as I said, so we don't have the luxury to set aside thousands of kilometers for just nature and to keep links there and people here, but we have to, to live in conditions uh, where people and links have to find way to coexist with one another. And to show you an example how close they are, this is a, a, a village in, uh, in East Albania. So these are the pastures next to the village where people normally graze their sheep on a day-to-day basis. And uh, not much further than 500 meters, so where the arrow is, we set uh, uh, a camera trap. This was back in 2014, I think. Uh, and uh, the, the results were, were staggering. So this is the normal protocol that we feel when we set uh, a camera trap so we can identify which trap has taken which photos. Um, 
and it was a it was like a forest road that was connecting two villages. Uh, it, it wasn't a tarmac road, so it's like a, a, a gravel road, but it's a road that people normally use. As you can see from these camera trap photos, people go from one village to the other. They use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Even cars move along, along this road. Uh, and on the very same road, we got the links. Um, again, cars moving by, um, a wolf on the very same road, on the very same spot. Again, people, I have no idea what they're doing here. It seems to be a policeman having captured the local criminal uh, and the bear on the very same spot. So it's very much a, a situation where um, basically people and, and animals use the same spaces. They, they uh, overlap for, for living spaces and uh, they have to find ways to, to uh, accept and tolerate each other. This is not to say that it's an ideal situation. It's not a paradise situation. In fact, there there are lots of conflicts in place uh, between people and uh, and large carnivores in general. Also, lynx in particular. Uh, of course, large carnivores they kill livestock. They can damage uh, crops and fruit trees, especially bears. They can damage beehives. They can even sometimes attack people, even though this has been very rarely reported and there hasn't been any recorded uh, evidence of a fatal attack for the last 50 years, neither from wolves or bears or lynx, it's out of question because there are very, very few cases worldwide where lynx are known to, to have attacked people. And of course, there is a, a, an, an innate fear among human species to be afraid of uh, of, uh, for their own safety and for the safety of, of their close ones. Uh, on the other hand, there are several threats that humans pose to, to large carnivores and to lynx in particular. Uh, they can directly persecute them. They can uh, uh, kill them either by a poaching or by a, a trapping, be that intentional or accidental. Uh, through their economic activities, they can cause massive habitat uh, degradation, so they reduce the living space of, of these species. And of course, they can reduce their, their food, their natural uh, uh, prey where, where they feed on. Uh, so it, it's very much a situation where conservationists need to find a way how to balance all this mess to, uh, to, to find solutions for the long-term preservation of these species. And how we do this, um, there is not one magic formula. Uh, there is always a trial and error approach. But uh, one of the uh, things that gives a long lasting impact is, of course, uh, education and awareness raising. And through our, through our program, we are uh, doing a lot of education work, especially with school children and trying to, to uh, make kids aware of uh, the natural values uh, uh, and of the landscapes there that uh, they live in uh, and of the animals that they have uh, present in these landscapes. Uh, another tool that we efficiently use, of course, is, uh, is through research. So we try to generate uh, the most up-to-date information on the distribution, presence and ecology of the species. And with that information, we can actually inform uh, successful conservation actions or, or adequate con conservation actions. Um, and of course, uh, what we do, what we also do is to also physically capture and uh, um, uh, equip these animals with uh, radio callers so we can track uh, their movement uh, in, in time and space and actually get very, very valuable information on their home ranges, on their prey, uh, on their feeding patterns, um, and, and also on the habitat uh, use. Um, yeah, these are some, uh, some of the first uh, individuals that were captured in, uh, in North Macedonia. Uh, and uh, you have four males here and one, one female lynx that were captured in, in south of uh, Mavrovo National Park in West Macedonia. Uh, and um, basically, this is an information that gives you uh, a lot of hints on, on what you need to do to preserve the species over the long term. So 
for instance, declaring new protected areas or engaging in these areas where links are, are present and use over the regular term with the local population and getting them to, to accept the links are quite important to, to do. And you can do this once you have this, uh, uh, this information from the scientific side of, uh, of conservation. And uh, we, we, do, we do this as, as inclusive as, uh, as possible, as we can do it. I mean, it's not something that we consider it's an exclusive domain of scientists, uh, but we try to, to actually engage all local actors and in particular the, uh, the administration of uh, protected areas where we work uh, to set cameras together, to conduct these uh, research exercises together so that they are actually actively involved in what we are doing and they do not perceive this as a work that belong to the to the scientists and uh, it, it's to the scientist world but actually work that is commonly generated by uh, several actors uh, so one of the 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 greatest things that we have done through the camera trapping research that we've done uh, over the past years is actually to look at the trend of the population. Uh, and uh, we started estimating the density of the population from the first camera trapping efforts that started in 2008 and which are continuing to date. And uh, if you see, uh, this is uh, uh, the density from the Mavrovo National Park in, uh, in Western uh, Macedonia. Uh, as you see, we can already detect uh, a slight increase of the uh, population density in that region. And uh, we cannot conclusively say, but we hypothesize that uh, this might be a direct factor of the work that the recovery program has done over the years from its beginning in 2006 and up to, to present days. It takes a lot of time. You cannot say we saved the species in 15 years. You cannot say we saved the species in, in 30 years. Even in 50 years, uh, I'm sure we will still have a lot of work to do uh, once we work for the conservation of, of these species. This is the red list uh, assessment that we did, which was based mostly on the uh, camera trapping work uh, that I've mentioned uh, several times. And uh, based on that exercise, we uh, classified the subspecies as critically endangered, which is one step before extinction. Well, one step before extinction in the wild, and then you have extinction if you don't have the animal in captivity somewhere in the world. And we don't have the Balkan lynx in captivity anywhere in the world, which means that uh, uh, if the situation does not change, uh, they will go extinct uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, we do a lot of work on the policy level, um, the information that we gather from, uh, from the field and from the uh, research that we conduct uh, actually informs our uh, um, policy uh, making uh, stakeholders and uh, the, the guys up in the respective governments. And uh, actually through our help and through our support, the Albanian government uh requested uh, to propose the balkan links in the in the second appendix of the burn convention which is a, a continental convention for the protection of uh, of species and habitats and by being in the second appendix it means that uh, uh, countries are obliged they have a, a legal obligation to take uh, 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 proactive action to secure the survival of the species and this was done back in 2017, and uh, we actually managed to get the uh, subspecies listed in the sec on the second appendix, and uh, to have countries committing stronger to to their uh, protection. This is the team that went to Strasbourg. Um, yeah, another uh, thing that we. Uh, engage a lot as i was saying earlier we have uh, all large carnivores present in in uh, in the country uh, we uh, try to actively uh, look at the uh, conflicts and at the perceptions actually that local people have towards uh, towards large carnivores and we do a lot of uh, um, 
social science work in, in this regard. And this has actually been the area of my personal uh, research focus in the past uh, to explore the local attitudes and perception that exist towards large carnivores uh, and to see how the, the local livelihoods are affected by, by uh, their presence. So this is, uh, this is basically done by talking to people uh, in the areas where, uh, where they conduct their activities in nature and um, uh, by, by actually being there and conducting uh, participant observation in their, daily, uh, in their daily activities when they are grazing their livestock, uh, when they are farming, when they are out uh, hunting and other activities that they might do in, in nature. So it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, the situation that we have over here in the Balkan, in the Balkans, in Albania in particular, but I would say also in the Balkans in, in general, is that uh, uh, this relative co uh, tolerance, this uh, coexistence that is present between people and large carnivores has a lot to do with the tradition, traditionalism being still present in the way how people uh, live their lives in, in, in mountain areas. If you look at this, um, at this flock of uh, goats, uh, you probably haven't noticed, but there is a dog there. And the dog is very, very important because that acts as, uh, as an active protector against the large carnivals. So there is very little chance of a lynx or of, uh, of a wolf or of a bear approaching this flock without the, the dog actually acting uh, on it. And actually, it's not just the, the, the dog. It's unusual to think, as in most Western Europe, the profession of shepherd has largely disappeared. But uh, in Albania, it's uh, uh, unacceptable to leave your livestock out in nature unattended. Uh, if, if you do that, they, you are simply irresponsible. Whereas I've been in, in many areas of Wales or Scotland, where you, know, you have these thousands and thousands of sheep just staying out in the open. And of course, you're going to have problems if you bring uh, wolves or lynx or bears back in, in a situation like that, because the first thing that they're going to do is that they're going to go and attack the livestock. And it's actually the combination of, of the shepherd with the dogs that, uh, that ensures that uh, attacks do not happen. You have the little dog there who is the first one to sense the predators and he starts barking like crazy, like bow, 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 bow. and that wakes up the, the, the big dog which starts barking a bit louder, like woo, woo. And the big dog wakes up the shepherd. And then the three together, uh, basically they are like an impenetrable armor for large carnivores. And that's what actually keeps conflict low. And that's what keeps tolerance towards large carnivores high. Um, okay. So basically what, uh, uh, what I want to say is that when it comes to large carnivore conservation in general uh, and lynx conservation in particular, it's, uh, it's mostly uh, about the locals and it's mostly about working with them and mostly about engaging with them and seeing how they deal uh, with large carnivore on a daily basis, but also how they live their lives uh, in, in, uh, in these landscapes. And we do, we do a lot of work with, uh, with the locals. And uh, basically, we are there not just as an outsider, as the, 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 the uh, crazy scientist that comes from uh, the big town, but actually people that stay there with them and listen to their problems and try to come up with, uh, with solutions uh, together with them. Um, I, like, I like this map. And uh, I, I didn't actually know that I was going to go on for so long. And I apologize. I apparently realized I'm very passionate about <laughs> these issues and I can go on talking for hours. Uh, but I like this map, even though it, these maps, even though they are a bit outdated now. Uh, but if you look closely, maybe not even that closely, uh, you can clearly say, uh, see some, some, some very visible trend. This is the distribution of bears, wolves, and lynx in Europe. And what you probably notice is that there are very little bears, wolves, and lynx in Central and Western Europe. And you have many of them in, in, in Eastern and, 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 North, and Northeastern Europe. 
what happened after the collapse of the uh, totalitarian regimes and of the communist regimes in, in Eastern Europe after the 90s is that these countries uh, really and quickly wanted to, 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 to become westernized and to, to, uh, to accede to the European Union. Britain is going the other direction anyway. Um, to accede to the European Union and to basically uh, be accepted in, in, in that community. So what happened is that they looked at the policies that Western Europe was, uh, was implementing for, for large carnivores and they said, ah, they seem to like wolves a lot and bears a lot and lynx a lot. So we are also going to align these policies with them, which is great. But uh, uh, what happened is that those policies were there because they didn't really have any. So they really valued much more having wolves and, and bears and lynx and they had them protected. Whereas in, in most Eastern, uh, Southeastern and Northeastern Europe, they were managed species. They were hunted and managed. And that was that hunting and management that was keeping the acceptance. So what happened was that you had this increase, uh, sharp increase in conflicts simply because uh, quick policy making without considering the, the, the needs of the local people happened in a very, uh, very short period of time. And actually, the overprotection of large carnivores brought more problems for them than, than one would have thought. Um, and this is actually something that we are trying to, to avoid happening in, in Albania. And we are trying to get uh, the local opinion being considered when it comes to decision making for the management and conservation of, of large carnivores. For instance, this is great. I mean, when when I when I used to read news like this, I I was almost um, I, I'm not saying laughing, but I was amused. I mean, you had one bear appearing in Germany after 130 years, and it made this big news. And what they did to the first bear that reappeared is that they shot it simply because they didn't have the mechanisms in place on the local level to, to coexist with, uh, with bears anymore. So the only solution that they could find was to kill the bear. Whereas here, a bear never makes it to the news. You know, people are so used to having bears in their landscape that they, uh, they, they actually actively know how to deal with them and it, uh, they do not become a problem. Not that they are not shot, but on the population level, uh, uh, people are able to create uh, mechanisms to coexist with them. And yeah, basically, this is what we are trying to, to, to actively promote, is to get the locals to, to embrace their livelihoods. Um, not everything that comes from, from far away and from the West is the right solution. Sometimes you have the solution there at your doorstep and you need to see it. And that is something that we are uh, actively trying to, to make locals uh, see on their, uh, on their, um, with the work that we are doing. So yeah, thank you. That was all. And sorry if I've gone on for too long. Thank, thank you, Alex. That, that was fantastic. Uh, don't don't uh, don't think for a moment that you've gone on too too long. I'd be happy to listen to you for another half an hour, and maybe I will because we're we're going to enter a little question and answer now. Uh, do you want to stop the uh, sc your screen share? Uh, uh, yes. Stop. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Good. Uh, so I. I out of your presentation, I, I must say, I really love that uh, that short bit in the middle where you uh, showed from the same camera trap angle uh, the humans, the cars, and all three carnivores. Um, and that's just so wonderful on that track. Uh, and it does illustrate uh, much of what you were saying there about the coexistence. Um, one, one th thing that it prompted me to think about, though, is uh, on your comparison of um, maps of the performance of the, the links in Albania with the, the map of uh, bears and wolves, it's clear that the bears and wolves are doing substantially better than the links. 
uh, and I was wondering why that was. What, what, what's, the, what's the difference ecologically that has, that, that's made that uh, so different? Um, I don't have a better answer. Sorry, I can hear my voice bouncing back. Maybe you can mute. Sorry. It's hard to um, because I hear myself, my voice bouncing back. Bob, if you can mute, I think it's coming from you. Okay, great. <laughs> um, there is no um, definite answer to that because there hasn't been proper uh, research focusing on that. But uh, some of the reasons that I can speculate on why that situation is as such is that is uh, it has to do on the um, uh, ecology and uh, habitat use of uh, the three species. So wolves and bears, they tend to be a bit more habitat generalist, which means that they can survive in uh, habitats that have been changed by humans to a higher degree, let's say, or been influenced by humans to a higher degree, whereas lynx tends to, to, to prefer some quieter areas. I mean, at, at least not habitats that have been intensively uh, used by humans. So wolves and bears tend to tolerate tolerate people uh, in their vicinity a bit more than lynx. That's why lynx are are uh, are probably uh, doing not that good as the the other two large carnivores. And it's also a question of uh, of uh, uh, the density of a species. I mean, lynx is by default a rare species. I mean, in in no situation you would you would have a situation where you would have too many lynx. It's a species that lives a solitary life and they tend not to tolerate other lynx being present in, the, in their home range. So if, if you have one male lynx, for instance, they can tolerate one or two females roaming in the same home range, but it's very likely the case that they won't tolerate another male within that, uh, that home range. And the same goes for, uh, for females in between, uh, in between each other. Uh, so you cannot have high density of, of, uh, of uh, links in any case. Wolves, as most of you uh, probably very well know, they can live in packs. So, and if there is, uh, if there is enough uh, food availability, they tend to tolerate the presence of other packs. Not to overlap, but to tolerate the presence of other packs. Only in situations of, of uh, food scarcity, you might have... Uh, uh, increased conflicts in between. Uh, and bears, it's, it's the same. I mean, they tend to be solitary, but they are a bit more uh, accepting of, of other bears than, than lynx are of other uh, um, lynx. So um, that, and, um, and yeah, probably those are the, the, the reasons why lynx have, uh, are doing a, a, a bit worse well, much worse than, than wolves and bears. And you, you find the same patterns uh, um, all over Europe, actually, where you had the lynx disappearing first and then usually followed by the bear. And then the wolf is usually the last to go. And the same pattern was observed in, in Britain as well. The lynx disappeared uh, somewhere in the 10th century. Um, I think the bears survive up to the 17th century. And then the last to go were probably the wolves who disappeared. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think in the beginning of the 19th century. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so can you just clarify for me also um, how, the, how the diet varies between the, uh, the different um, major carnivores? Are, are they all, would they all attack uh, large deer? Or are, are, is it uh, is it feral goats, or what? What are the main, main uh, uh, things that they're relying on for predatory animal? animal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So again, lynx tends tend to be a little bit more specialist in this regard. So they 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 tend to select the, their prey a bit more and specialize a bit more in the type of food that they hunt. So they are strictly uh, carnivorous, and they tend to prefer 
uh, wild prey, uh, contrary to domestic prey in, in a sense. Uh, so there, from, from several studies all over Europe and uh, from the preliminary information we have from the Balkans, the roe deer constitutes the main prey species for, for the lynx. And that is followed by the, the chamois, which is a species of uh, wild goat um, that is present usually in southern uh, Europe. And the uh, hare uh, and fox make up the, the third and fourth species, depending on where they, um, depending on the location and the availability. So uh, wolves, they tend to focus on the larger wild, wild prey, so they can feed on red deer and wild boar if they are present more. Um, they, they do a lot of uh, attacks on domestic livestock if, if uh, they are present and uh, if wild prey is not so available. Uh, so they tend to attack sheep, horses, cows. Uh, again, if, if wild prey is not so available, they will start switching to, to domestic prey. And bears, basically, they, they eat everything. <laughs> I mean, they, they can eat from uh, grass to uh, wild prey, they tend to focus, here they tend to focus more um, in, in, uh, in um, ground insects and in forest fruits, but it depends very much on the region. I mean, in, in Northern Europe, for example, they tend to focus a bit, they're a bit more carnivorous, so they focus a bit more on, on meat and on carrion. Um, depends where they are. You have areas in, in uh, in Siberia, where they almost exclusively focus on wild prey and on, on fish, on salmon. So it, it depends a lot where they are, but they can eat everything. That's the, the general idea. Okay, th thank you. Uh, okay, taking a couple of questions from some other people now. Um, there's a couple of questions about uh, how how one might deal with the, the low numbers that you're dealing with. And Andrew Lack asks, uh, is it worth considering um, introducing closely related subspecies, uh, some, some members, in order to uh, just to bulk up the, uh, um, the, the, the local population? What's your attitude to that? Yeah, thank you. A very, very good question. Actually, that's that's the debate that we are having right now among uh, colleagues and our working group, uh, because from the, the very little genetic information that we have so far, it seems that the population is not doing so well in terms of uh, genetic variability. Of course, you have very few individuals, so it's it's uh, it's almost. Uh, uh, granted that you're going to have genetic erosion over the long term uh, given the fact that uh, you have less and less chances of, of individuals which are uh, further related from each other to actually uh, meet and uh, and uh, mate um, one thing that uh, it's it's being actively debated is because this uh, genetic uniqueness of uh, of the balkan links uh there is a fear that uh, uh if we introduce individuals from another uh population or another subspecies this uniqueness will disappear so you basically end up with uh with animals that uh, you can no more call pure balkan lynx i personally do not uh, like this stand so much because I tend to think on the population level and having it survive over the long term. So if it will help the population survive, at the end of the day, that genetic material will be saved and transmitted over the, the long term and we will have the, the population surviving. Uh, however, now we have increasing evidence that the Balkan links is probably uh, the same even though there is no uh, conclusive evidence for this, if not the same, it's very closely related to the Anatolian uh, links so to, and the Caucasus links. And basically they have spread in the Balkans in the, in, from the last uh, glacial period. Uh, they have uh, spread from, the, uh, from Anatolia and the Caucasus via the Bosporus uh, Strait, which didn't used to be 
divided by the, the Bosphorus trade back then and uh, spread in, in the Balkans. So we are, we are finding that these uh, animals are probably uh, very closely related to one another. And we are starting discussions of potentially having individuals from the Caucasus lynx being introduced into the Balkan lynx population and by doing so give a boost to, to, to the population to survive. But this is all very preliminary and just the initial discussions that we are having. Okay, I understood. Uh, but uh, uh, another suggestion by Jenny Kennedy is have pet, is the consideration being given to captive breeding program. Yes, this is another another thing that we have discussed. Um, there has been a very successful captive breeding program for the Iberian lynx, um, where basically the entire population bounced, and that concerns even a, a completely separate species of lynx. So we are talking on the species level. Uh, so the, the captive breeding program of, of the Iber Iberian lynx has been propagated as a very successful one, and the one which managed to, to get the population from critically endangered to endangered, so it's still endangered, but that's a big jump in terms of threat level. Uh, in the past uh, 30 to 40 years, I would say. And uh, that, that has been something that we had been discussing. Uh, however, we, in, the, in the situation that we are now, where we don't have any Balkan links in captivity, uh, and considering the cost that such an undertake, undertaking would require, and the fact that even by removing one individual from such a small population from the wild and keeping it in captivity, it's already a big, big cost for the population. At the moment, it's not being uh, considered as an option. And what we are trying to do is that we are trying to direct uh, the conservation funding and the resources to preserving the areas where they survive in the wild. If we, if we would have had, uh, captive uh, individuals, like it was the case for the Iberian lynx many years ago, we, we would have probably opted for that option, but given the fact that we don't have any, uh, we, we would much more spend uh, the money available and the resources in preserving the species where it is right now, rather than taking it away, keeping it in captivity with the hope of getting them multiplied in the future. Very good. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Um, Sally Gillard was asking, uh, what is the potential for ecotourism uh, as a, a source of um, funding and support for, uh, well, for all your carnivores, really, but, uh, but particularly the link? Yeah, thank you. That's, uh, that's ecotourism. <laughs> we, we hope that it's going to be the answer to <laughs> many of our worries especially when it comes with uh, when it comes to the relation between links and uh, and locals um, ecotourism is a new concept in the in the region as i also said during my presentation this used to be a region with a very troubled political uh, and historical past so uh, normal activities of tourists coming over and uh, enjoying nature and being out in nature uh, are a reality from the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Before that, um, it was actually quite risky to come here and to, to conduct tourism in general. Um, so uh, that is one thing that uh, locals are becoming uh, increasingly more aware of, and uh, they are really starting to value the presence of, uh, of the species in, in, uh, in their vicinity and uh, to see the species as also a way to start generating some, some income. And we are trying to promote this uh, by actually supporting uh, ecotourism initiatives. And we have even started some collaboration with some uh, uh, tour operators where uh, we try to promote a different type of, uh, of tourism, not the one where you simply go somewhere and you take the photos and you exploit and you want to get what you get from nature but actually a type of tourism where where tourists come 
and uh, they do get their tours and their guides by conservationists where we actually actively talk to them about our conservation efforts and uh, at the end they do not just pay for 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 the tour but actually part of that uh, of that money goes to directly help uh, uh, conservation actors and the the actual locals where they are accommodated and where they stay and where they 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 eat so we are trying to uh, strongly promote this and we see that as uh, as something that will uh, will increase and keep the acceptance of links uh, among locals Oh, yeah, very good. That, that sounds like a really good model. Um, uh, Jack Pipe has raised an interesting point. Uh, you, you were emphasizing the fact that uh, Albania has maintained its tradition of, of active shepherding. Um, but Jack Piper asked, are, are young people moving into shepherding or is there going to be a, a lack of shepherds at some point in the future? Yeah, uh, that is actually something that is changing very fast. And we have uh, less and less young people being interested in, in shepherding and actually actively engaging in shepherding. And uh, with the policies that, uh, that the government is actually implementing, there are fewer and fewer incentives to, to actually engage with, uh, uh, with traditional stock breeding. Uh, and what they try to promote is that they, they try to promote this large scale intensive type of, uh, of stock breeding. And of course, in situations like that, uh, mountain areas in particular are suffering a lot, uh, also from uh, depopulation. Uh, so people are leaving to either go to big cities or abroad. Uh, and uh, it, it's very, very difficult to uh, to find young people who are actually willing to uh, to continue with the with the shepherding tradition. But as I said earlier, uh, one of the things that we hope to keep the traditions alive is the demand for uh, uh, for uh, sustainable ecotourism, and that's uh, that's the one thing where we hope to uh, to actually have people find incentives to stay in these areas and to actually find it profitable to stay in these areas and find it profitable to continue doing uh, what they're doing. It's not easy. Uh, it's definitely trying to go against the, the, the flow, uh, but uh, we, we are trying to uh, promote mechanisms and to, to give to locals incentives to continue doing what, uh, what they're doing uh, and to find the profit actually in what they're doing before they actually uh, change their their livelihoods and abandon this uh, this type of lifestyle once and for good. Of course, there's going to be change. Change is inevitable, um, but uh, with uh, with targeted actions and with promoting uh, uh, and upkeeping certain types of of, uh, of livelihoods and making them profitable, we hope to, uh, to maintain uh, this system uh, for a while. Thank you. Um, in a way, you kind of anticipated a question that was, I was then going to ask about from Martin Steiner. Uh, the question of, it's hard to assess, uh, given the, the general world global trend, I suppose, from people from the a uh, uh, rural situation going into the urban situation it, you know is that a positive or a negative from your point of view and from the from the links's point of view given this complicated interaction um of obviously it, it provides more space in a way for the animals but at the same time it provides uh, less incentive for local people to be involved and, and so on yeah, it's it's actually a, a big debate, I think, going on on the continental, even on worldwide level, I think, on which direction we want to go. Because to some extent, having more people moving from rural areas to urban areas, hypothetically, opens up more space for nature uh, and in a way might be beneficial for nature. 
but I think it has more to do with the type of system you promote and the types of livelihoods people actually conduct in rural areas that is actually more relevant. And I think as long as, uh, as rural areas uh, focus on uh, low impact farming that is far away from from intensive farming they focus on uh, on uh, on uh, quality production and not on mass production um, i think it's actually more beneficial to keep people in in rural areas when it especially when it comes uh, to large carnivores because like that you do have these coexistence mechanisms surviving rather than having people depopulating these areas large carnivores coming in uh, finding much more space and then having these urbanites that go out in nature don't know how to deal with large carnivores and have an increase in in, in conflicts as a consequence so <clears throat> i'm sorry so uh, yeah it depends very much where you're at and uh, what type of uh, policies in land use are in place but certainly for Albania, depopulation of rural areas would actually, oddly enough, I think it would increase uh, conflicts with large carnivores and would make the situation worse for them over the long term than, than you would think. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, following that uh, thought in a way, Southwest Mogao asks, uh, do you think we have enough suitable habitat in the UK to support a lynx reintroduction um, from your experience of, of the large home ranges they have and so forth? Well, this reminds me of actually uh, a very nice uh, trip that uh, I had uh, up, uh, up in Scotland where I was uh, at Wild Crew. Uh, we did this field trip in, in this uh, reserve. Um, that uh, a very i don't remember his name but he was a very rich guy who had bought this land or he owned that land and he had said i'll keep this land aside for for nature and i'll do rewilding here and uh, i'll bring back all the big uh, mammals and he had already brought some wild boars and uh, moose if i'm not mistaken the big uh, the big deer with the big uh, antlers uh, and, and, and one of the wild crew PhD students, he was doing his PhD research there. And uh, I remember having very nice conversations because uh, I think the reserve was something like uh, 90 hectares. And uh, the, I was asked the question, so how many links do you think we can keep here? And I said, one. <laughs> so... Um, this is not to say that there is not space uh, in, in, uh, in the UK for lynx reintroduction, but it is to say that they do require vast areas. But uh, in, in, in our experience, it's not that much about uh, the habitat suitability, uh, in a sense, as it is more on prey availability, which I think the UK has plenty. And even more importantly, on human acceptance. So as long as you have enough prey, and as long as you have people accepting the species being present, I think you have the conditions for the, the, the species to come back. And I think the, the UK is doing very well in terms of prey availability. At least when I, was, uh, uh, when I was in Scotland, I saw that there was lots of deer roaming around. The problem is that the, the, the shepherding methods there, the, the sheep keeping, uh, methods there are such that the, the reintroduction of a big predator, like the lynx, which potentially can attack sheep and can kill sheep, uh, if, if those methods of keeping sheep do not change, uh, I, I see it as very difficult because by bringing back uh, a species like that, you would immediately increase the conflict with sheep owners. Um, so it, it has much more to do with that than with habitat availability. I mean, lynx, if they have enough prey, um, there is a, a subspecies of lynx who, who, who even survives in Tibet without any forest at all. I mean, it's a locally adapted one, but because they have enough prey, and of course, people tend to tolerate them and have coexistent mechanisms, uh, they, they are present even there. 
I think there is enough forests and prey in, in, in the UK. I think the, the human acceptance side you need to, uh, needs much more much more work uh, before a species like that comes back. You can have them back in, in situations like the one I said in Scotland. I mean, where you have this reserve that is set aside, but you need thousands of, of square kilometers to even think about a, a minimum viable population. And yeah, if you if you can set aside 10,000 square kilometers, okay, but I don't think that's going to be that easy. Yeah, thank you. Um, perhaps going back to, to your situation in, the, in Albania now, uh, is uh, Alexandra Jameson asked, is, is the hunting of lynx still a problem now, or, or has, has it uh, kind of petered out? Have you got over that? Um, well, the, the lynx is not a game species. So the lynx has been a protected species in, uh, in Albania from the records we have at least since 1956, which means it has always been considered as a rare and, uh, and protected species. Before that, I think there was some hunting for, uh, for their fur, but again, not a massive one. I mean, you can never have a um, vast amount of, of lynx hunting simply because they are not, there are not that many. Um, so it has been a protected species and there is no controlled or legal hunting of, of lynx, at least since uh, 1956. And in the neighboring countries, I think it's more or less the same. Well, it is protected for sure, but I'm saying it has been protected more or less around the same time. Um, of course, there is poaching. Uh, that's something that uh, almost never goes away. And it has a lot to do with, uh, with law enforcement, with the strength of law enforcing authorities, with uh, awareness, um, with education, with poverty. It has to do with many factors. Um, but yeah, that is something that I think goes on for all species or most of the species worldwide, no matter whether they are uh, threatened um, or not. And that is actually one of the main reasons for, for extinction. Okay, for, for, uh, one question, this is probably the last question, but um... You mentioned that the, right at the beginning that uh, uh, in order to conserve the links, you had to spend most of your time and effort con conserving the rest of the ecosystem and, the, and so forth in order to, uh, for it to thrive. Um, could you talk a bit more about that? For instance, um, did you have to do anything? actively to increase the, the prey availability for the lynx or, uh, or actively in, improve the habitats um, uh, in, 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 in a way, the, 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 the vegetation and so forth? Or, or, it, it, or, or can, it, can it be divided up in that way, your, your, your work? Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. Actually, one of the things that uh, I've come to realize after, well, I'll say 17 years of <laughs> working with uh, with links uh, with links conservation, is that I mean I, I showed you with this presentation a lot of nice links pictures out in nature and uh, other species and beautiful pictures like that, but actually if you, if you see my day to day work, it's a bunch of paperwork. And uh, a lot of meetings and a lot of uh, talking uh, in the past year, talking over the phone and via Zoom mostly, but a lot of talking with people uh, and uh, increasingly less so being actually in nature and actually conducting ecological research. Um, so what, what we've come to realize is that nature does everything perfectly once you let it be. So you don't really need to, to, to actively um, intervene in nature for it to, 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 to create the conditions for a species to survive. It, it can do it perfectly uh, uh, on its own. Um, 
what what you need to do a lot is to work with uh, with the people that conduct activities in nature and with people that for example go and cut the forest or, or with people that uh, go and graze their sheep with people that go out hunting those are the people that you need to interact uh, almost constantly and to to um, look at their livelihoods to 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 look at their opinions and to work together with them in finding common common solutions uh, in in uh, in what they do, so that uh, so that what they do is actually not detrimental, but actually beneficial for for the links. This is not to say that there are no uh, um, habitat intervention measures that uh, one can do to improve the situation. We, as as a group. Uh, over here in, in Albania and the wider region, uh, we have not uh, engaged that much in, in direct habitat management or habitat intervention measures to make the, the situation uh, better. Uh, in that we have, for instance, um, intervened uh, with wor in working with the local population to actually improve habitats by improving their own livelihoods. For example, one very successful action that we have taken is to promote the reforestation of, uh, of some degraded areas uh, by actually using trees that were beneficial to the locals. And we we're using chestnuts and uh, walnuts and uh, trees that were basically giving something back to the locals and at the same time uh, creating some uh, uh, some good habitats for for wildlife and many many wildlife species. So in that sense, we have uh, we have done uh, uh, work work in that regard. But as I said, I think I mean probably ninety percent of my time goes <laughs> in dealing with people and and with. Uh, with bureaucracies, with talking with government officials, talking with uh, local officials, uh, talking with local people, with other organizations. And that is uh, that at the end of the day, sadly to say, I think at the end of the day, that constitutes most of the, the, the conservation work. We are inspired by, by, uh, by nature. I actually have here the, the very first track that I found of links in nature. This was back in 2005 and I always keep this uh, nearby simply not to forget you know sometimes you are <laughs> on your day with a pile of paperwork and you need something like this to bring you back and to re-inspire you in, in, in doing what uh, uh, what you're doing <clears throat> so yeah okay thank you very much Alex that's uh, that's been wonderful um, Thank you for the, the talk and for your uh, eloquent answers to all these difficult questions. Um, I'm, I'd miss you have any uh, final comments that you want to make, but I think we're at a, at a good point to finish. Uh, I would like to hand over to uh, Alison Leaf now for some uh, closing remarks on the evening. If she would like to unmute herself and reveal herself. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, I echo Bob in saying fantastic talk. Um, really is a beautiful animal, and it's great to hear your passion for um, such a wonderful creature. Um, but I think almost in some ways the most impressive thing is how long you have been working on the project. And really, that is the way to win because you show your commitment to people, you get to know the people and they get to know you and they see that you're following this through. So we wish you the very best for the project. And maybe one day we'll have our lynxes in Scotland. There is quite a lot of wild country. So, you know, I'm not giving up on that, but it's great to hear your optimism for some uh, sensitive conservation tourism. And uh, thank you for your lovely photos and also the great maps. I love to see all the distribution of the animals. So um, really fantastic talk and a species we have not heard about before. So that is uh, really wonderful. So, and many thanks for staying into this late hour in the evening, because you're an hour ahead. So, big clap. Oh, thank you. Everybody clap. Thank you. At home. It was a pleasure. Thanks oh, a lot. Uh, so my final thing is just to say our last talk of the season, when hopefully spring will be coming by the 8th of March, 
we're heading back to Scotland uh, for a talk on marine mammals and ocean conservation by Professor Sasha Hooker, who's professor at the Scottish Oceans Institute at the University of St Andrews. And St Andrews, despite being a fairly small place, has always been a very big player in marine biology. And a couple of years ago, they were able to open a brand banking new Scottish Oceans Institute that brings together all their diverse research into species, ecology, economics, climate change. And so Sasha is going to give us a bit of an overview and talk a bit about her research and a bit about the um, activity of the Scottish Oceans Institute. So I look forward to seeing you all then. <laughs> 